Well, and welcome to Religious Inclusion in Our Community, a program presented by Hershey Area All Things Diversity. I'm Susan Cord, a member of our diversity group. Hershey Area All Things Diversity is a free series of programs to create awareness and promote acceptance and inclusion in our community. It's coordinated by Derry Township, the Hershey Story Museum, Derry Township School District, Milton Hershey School, the Downtown Hershey Association, the Hershey Company, Penn State Health, Hershey Entertainment and Resorts, and the Hershey Trust Company. Our speaker is Dr. Jeffrey D. Long, Professor of Religion and Asian Studies at Elizabethtown College. We hope that this educational session will help you identify beliefs and practices of differing religious orientations and also help you engage more easily with those who have different beliefs. Dr. Long spoke to our group before and he's very passionate about this topic. So I know we're all in store for a very inspiring next hour or so. Now I'll turn things over to Hershey Area All Things Diversity member, Amy Ziegler of the Hershey Story Museum to introduce Dr. Long. Thank you. Um, I'll just give some quick background. Dr. Long, Professor of Religion and Asian Studies at Elizabethtown College, specializes in the religions and philosophies of India. He is the author of several books and numerous articles, as well as the editor of the series, Explorations in Indic Traditions. In 2018, he received the Hindu American Foundation's Dharma Seva Award for his ongoing efforts to promote more accurate and culturally sensitive portrayals of Indic traditions in the American educational system and popular media. He has spoken in numerous venues, both national and international, including Princeton University, Yale University, and the University of Chicago. And he has given three talks at the United Nations. Thank you so much for coming back to join us tonight, Dr. Long. Thank you very much for inviting me today. I'm really grateful to be here. And thank you to all of you who are watching. And uh, I hope you find this program engaging and, and interesting and uh, look forward to answering any questions that you might have uh, at the end. So I'm going to start sharing my screen. And um, let's see, just wanna make sure I do this correctly. So yes, hopefully you will be seeing uh, right now my uh, slideshow, the first slide. Uh, know thy neighbor, cultivating a community of acceptance and mutual respect across religious boundaries. Uh, can everyone see that? Uh, is it's appearing okay? All right, very good. So. Uh, let us continue uh, with the presentation. Uh, what am I going to cover today? This presentation will cover the basics of coexisting with neighbors and colleagues with differing religious orientations, creating and sustaining a welcoming environment, and give a broad overview of the world's religions. So you'll get a crash course in uh, world religions tonight. Uh, we'll, we won't be able to cover everything in detail, but at least it will give uh, a basic overview of the diversity that exists. I will be speaking both as a scholar and from my experiences in the American Hindu community. So uh, who am I? Uh, so this rather colorful picture uh, here is of me uh, celebrating the Hindu uh, holiday of Holi, uh, spelled H-O-L-I. That's our spring festival. And as you can see, it's a very colorful festival. Uh, I don't normally uh, look like that. Um, I was raised Roman Catholic in rural Missouri, uh, and I began an intensive study of the world's religions and philosophies in my childhood after the death of my father. My father was in a really very bad accident when I was 10. Uh, he passed away when I was 12. And this just got me thinking a lot about the big issues, uh, life, death, suffering, uh, what happens after we die. Uh, all of those kinds of questions were very, uh, very urgent for me uh, at that time. And so I began studying a wide range of different traditions. And really, I've made this my life work. And so uh, I, I'm interested in the philosophies, the, the teachings of the various traditions, uh, also in their history and the cultures that gave rise to them, and in really uh, communicating uh, the insights of these traditions uh, to to others uh, so that we can all understand the world's religions better. Uh, I was drawn myself to a Hindu worldview and practice. Uh, a lot of my life uh, as a result of this has been what I call bridge building. And this is in my professional life, but also in my personal life. Uh, there aren't that many people who are not of Indian descent who practice Hinduism uh, in America, though there are probably more of us than you would expect, a uh, few thousand uh, of us. 
so uh, in many ways, I find that uh, I'm in a position of explaining not only Hinduism, but India, Indian religions, Indian philosophies, Indian culture to people here in the U.S. Um, who are not familiar with it, and also to some extent explaining Western Christianity, bridge building uh, has and so I'm hoping in our one feel welcome. That is our goal. A community where uh, people from a wide array, really ideally all religious orientations, practices, uh, would feel that they're part of the community. How do we move from intolerance, which is really bad state of affairs where people don't feel safe or comfortable being themselves and, and practicing and living their religious identity? How do we move from intolerance to tolerance? Uh, that is where people are able to practice and live without fear uh, of harm or exclusion. And then how do we move beyond tolerance to acceptance and mutual respect? Uh, this idea of tolerance is something that we, we like to promote a lot. But if you think about it, it's really not enough. Uh, as I'm fond of asking my students sometimes, uh, if, if, you were, if you were a college student and you were going back to your dorm room in the evening after class and your roommate said to you, I tolerate you, how would you feel? Uh, would, would you feel very comfortable with that roommate? You probably want to change rooms, right? Uh, we don't want to be tolerated. It's better than not being tolerated, right? It's better than intolerance. But really, acceptance and mutual respect is our ideal. Acceptance where we all feel welcome and mutual respect. The, spec, the respect isn't only going one way, but that we are respecting and being respected by the people around us. So how do we get to that point? So there's some basic concepts. There's some terminology I'm going to be using. Uh, one is religious orientation. This is a somewhat new way of talking about what maybe in the past people have called religious affiliation or religious identity. But I think it's a much tighter concept because orientation is individualized. Uh, it doesn't simply mean being a member of a particular church or tradition, uh, but it, it is how do you personally experience it and relate to religion. A welcoming society that we would all really like to, uh, to live in. So how we orient around religion includes the entire range of our cognitive and affective dispositions toward it, or in more simple language, what we think or believe, as well as how we feel, how we respond on an emotional level. All of that is our religious orientation. Religious orientations include not being religious at all. You know, maybe it's just not something that interests you or that you've ever felt particularly drawn to. Uh, that's your religious orientation. So it doesn't mean being religious necessarily. Uh, being a nominal adherent of a religion, that is, maybe you were raised in a religion, but it's not your top priority in life. It's not the first maybe one of the first two or three things you think of when you are asked, you know, who are you? You, you maybe don't really think of it. Um, being deeply committed to a religion to the point where maybe that is your primary identity. You, you see yourself chiefly in terms of your religious orientation. Participating in more than one religion. And in fact, this is quite common in many other cultures and societies. Uh, as we'll see, it's very common in East Asia, that is civilizations like Japan and China, uh, this has been very common for thousands of years. Uh, India, too. Um, at the same time, uh, it's beginning to become more common in the Western world. And uh, you're seeing this as a kind of trend of spirituality, especially am among younger people, drawing on many traditions, but not committing or seeing oneself as being defined by just one, and so on. So these are all examples of religious orientation. Worldview is another concept that I will refer to from time to time. Our worldview is our philosophy of life, what we believe about the nature of reality, as well as our values. So uh, it's closely related to religion, but it's not the same. Worldview and religious orientation usually have a strong impact on one another. 
but they're not exactly the same thing. Uh, worldview is really much more cognitive. It's, you know, what do you think? Uh, if someone says to you, where did the universe come from? What is life? What happens after we die? What do you think about that? That's part of your worldview, as well as your values. What's right and wrong? What should you do in a certain situation, for example? Um, religion is more than belief. It's more than worldview. We often identify religion with beliefs, but religion is much more than that. In fact, some traditions make belief secondary to practice. In the Hindu tradition, for example, there are actually a lot of different belief systems, but they're all considered Hindu and they're all acceptable. But there are certain ways of living that are understood to apply to everybody. And so what we would call morals or ethics, what's called in the Hindu tradition dharma, that really is what matters most. Whereas in other traditions like Christianity, historically, it's been very much about belief, you know, having a creed and adhering to it and so on. Uh, the worldviews of individuals may vary a great deal, even within a single religious community. So worldview and religion are not precisely identical, even though they do uh, impact one another. Uh, here is a picture of uh, Christians reciting the Nicene Creed, the Apostles' Creed. Uh, let's say we randomly take uh, three people from this crowd, and, and after they've recited the creed, we ask them, what did that mean to you? What, what do you think that means? You know, I believe in one God, the Father, creator of heaven and earth, and so on. It's likely, uh, or certainly possible at least, that one of those three people will give a fairly orthodox account of Christian theology, uh, unpacking the creed based on uh, how it has been historically understood by Christian communities. Someone else might give you a very novel interpretation that has to do with their particular life experience and how they understand uh, this creed. And it might even be something that traditional churches might regard as heretical, but it could well be the view of that person. Uh, a third person you ask might say, I have no idea what this means. I'm here to keep my parents happy. Uh, and I was thinking about, you know, the TV show I watched last night when I recited the creed. So you'll have all of those reactions if everyone's honest, uh, if we ask, uh, you know, what does the creed mean to you? So ultimately, uh, I, I personally am persuaded by something that Mahatma Gandhi said once. Uh, in reality, there are as many religions as there are individuals. Right? We talk about Christians, we talk about Hindus, Muslims, Jews, Buddhists, and so on. But people are more than their religions, right? If, if I tell you, say, I practice a form of Hinduism, or someone says, I practice Christianity, you might be able to say a bit about what that person believes about their worldview, maybe a bit about their practice based on that, if you have some background, some understanding of that tradition. But uh, it's not going to predict everything about the person. Uh, people are not simply stereotypes. We cannot simply deduce from someone's religious identity what all their ideas and actions will be. So everyone's different. Everyone's unique. And this, I think, is, is one of the most important things we have to understand when we are encountering religious difference in our communities. If we treat people as if they're going to be sort of cookie-cutter stereotypes based on their religion, we're going to miss out on the full richness of those people as individuals, and we'll do them an, an injustice. And in fact, quite often, we might project onto them beliefs and views that they don't actually hold. Someone might say, oh, I've read about that religion. You all do this, right? And you might say something to the person that is actually very offensive to them. That is not what they believe at all. They say, no, no, I don't believe in that at all. Uh, and so these kinds of assumptions need to be uh, really monitored very carefully. Everyone is different. Everyone is unique. Practices and interpretations greatly vary with individual life circumstances. And if you come from a religious tradition or background, you'll, you'll know this is the case just from your own life experience, uh, that there's a very rich array of dispositions and attitudes and views that people hold, even within a single religious community. Well, that's true of every other religion as well. Uh, it's not you know, just your own experience. This is, this is everyone's experience. Some general ob observations, though, can be made. Uh, it's not impossible to talk about religions and, and groups of religions, as long as we bear in mind that we're making generalizations. And it's sort of necessary. You can't get very far in life without making some generalizations. Right? Otherwise, you wouldn't be able to predict anything that's going to happen from moment to moment. Uh, but we have to be mindful of them, that they are generalizations, and be prepared for exceptions to basically everything uh, that we learn 
about a particular religious tradition or belief or practice. So I'm going to go through a very, very broad overview of the world's religions, uh, just to give an idea of the religious diversity that exists. Because when we say the world's religions, we aren't really just talking about the whole globe. But if you look at life here in America today, um, particularly in urban areas, but even in small towns and, and rural communities, just about every one of these religions is practiced somewhere by somebody. Uh, the diversity in our country right now in the U.S. is very, very great. And so in many ways, we are a kind of mini model of, uh, of the world's religions. So I'm going to give a very broad overview. But again, bearing in mind uh, in regard to everything that I say, that the individuals within each tradition I'm going to talk about are all going to have their own take, their own understanding, and might not even agree with the characterization that I'm giving. But again, these are generalizations. They're going to apply the vast majority of the time. So if you think of the world's religions, uh, they form something like a family. It's almost like a big tree. And trees have branches, right? You could say the trunk is sort of the shared history of human religiosity, spirituality. Something like religion has existed it seems almost as long as there have been human beings. Uh, there's evidence that uh, Neanderthals, uh, one of our early ancestors, had religion. Uh, they engaged in burial. They engaged in some kind of ritual practice when members of their community died. Uh, so presumably they had some beliefs connected with that and uh, something connected with what we might call religion. Um, one of the oldest monuments uh, ever created uh, dates back almost to the Ice Age. It was unearthed in, in Turkey in a place called, and I'm probably not going to pronounce it correctly, but I believe it's called Gobleke Tepe. Um, it, it's a very, very old monument, which has very clear religious meaning. And its creation was very difficult uh, with, with the technology that people had almost 10,000 years ago. They had to carry stones from a very, very, very large distance. And the carving of them and the arranging of them uh, was something that clearly was planned beforehand. So this has shown, uh, and some scholars have argued, that some type of religiosity is very, very, very old. It's not something that sort of developed later, uh, but it seems to be, uh, might be too much to say hardwired into us, but it is a very deep part of the human experience. So as, as human beings have spread around the world, uh, our religions, our ways of, of encountering what we regard as most sacred and, and thinking about it, these have all changed uh, over time, and so you have the emergence of great diversity. You could almost make it see it as a parallel with the diversity of languages, how languages have also changed over time. And yet there are families of languages. There are languages that are related to one another. Uh, you know, we all know that you know, if, if you learn Spanish, it's pretty easy to then learn French because they both come from Latin and so on. The world religions also form families. So the family that is probably the most familiar to most of you uh, listening today, the most practiced in the Western world, are called the Abrahamic religions. Uh, they're called that because they regard an ancient patriarch uh, named Abraham as a sacred figure. They all trace themselves in some fashion back to Abraham. So Judaism is the oldest of these uh, Abrahamic religions uh, historically. And within Judaism, you have variety, right? There's the Orthodox Jewish tradition, conservative, reform, and I say etc. here because you have other Jewish communities as well, and you have subsets of each of those three. So again, uh, if you kept dividing and dividing, we'd finally come down to the individual level of a Jewish person and that person's belief and practice. But these are the trends, right? These are the, the broader uh, communities that uh, exist. Second of the Abrahamic religions to emerge, um, most widely practiced religion in America and in the world uh, is Christianity. And it has its branches also, of course, the Roman Catholic Church, the Protestant traditions, the Eastern Orthodox traditions, and again, etc. You have branches of Christianity that don't quite fit into any of those three, or you have subdivisions uh, of those three uh, as well. Uh, Islam, the third uh, of the Abrahamic religions to emerge, uh, and it has its divisions, the two best known and, and most followed being the Sunni and the Shia, but there are other forms of Islam as well. Now, I've presented these in historical order, uh, but even this is something which could be debated uh, by people of differing religious orientations. For example, uh, when I say Islam is the third, the most recent of the Abrahamic religions, 
I'm counting from the lifetime of the Prophet Muhammad, uh, who is uh, the founder of Islam, at least as we know it today. But if you are Muslim, if you are uh, a believer, a practitioner of Islam, uh, you have certainly been raised with the teaching that the first prophet, the first teacher of Islam was Adam, the first human being. So from an Islamic perspective, Islam is the oldest of the world's religions. And so uh, even questions like when did something emerge uh, is something that can be debated and about which there are going to be different points of view. So you can see religion is it's a minefield, right? Someone might have very, very strong views about any of these topics. Uh, the traditions that uh, I teach and that I've become most familiar with, uh, another branch of the family of world religions is called the Dharma traditions. Uh, these traditions originated in India. Uh, though they're now global, they're all practiced all over the world today, uh, but they all started in India. Uh, the oldest of these is uh, in the Western world, it's called Hinduism. Um, many Hindus prefer to refer to Hindu Dharma, that is Hindu way of life, uh, or Sanatana Dharma, which means the eternal way of life. And like other traditions, there are different sub-varieties of Hindu practice. So there's the Vaishnava tradition, the Shaiva tradition, the Shakta tradition, and others as well. Hinduism is very internally diverse, internally variegated. And again, each of those branches, the Vaishnavas, the Shaivas, etc., there are sub-branches, you could say, of, of each of those. So uh, each tradition we're looking at is, is very diverse internally. Uh, another one uh, emerging from India is Buddhism. Uh, the uh, Buddhist tradition came uh, also from India. Uh, it has also branches, Theravada, which is practiced primarily in Southeast Asia and Sri Lanka. Uh, Mahayana, which is practiced more in North and East Asia, so China, Japan, Korea. Vajrayana, which is associated mainly with Tibet and Nepal. Uh, Navayana, which means the new vehicle, and that's a term that's been coined, a Sanskrit term, for Buddhism in the Western world. There are Buddhists who have adapted Buddhism to American life, European life. They've brought in modern psychology and uh, modern science into their understanding of Buddhism. There is Jainism, uh, a less known but very important tradition uh, that's had a lot of impact on uh, the uh, other two traditions, on, on Hinduism and Buddhism. There are also sub-branches of Jainism. There are the Shvetambaras, the Digambaras, and, and some other varieties as well. Even though that's a fairly small community, there are only about 5 million Jains in the world. But there, too, you have sub-traditions within the larger tradition. And there are bridge traditions. There are traditions that don't quite fit into the Abrahamic or the Dharmic families, uh, but that overlap both in interesting ways. Uh, there is the Sikh tra tradition, Sikhism, the Sikh faith, uh, which is around 500 years old, and uh, it has close connections to both the Hindu and Islamic traditions. There is Zoroastrianism, which is a very ancient tradition. In fact, it was one of the first world religions. It was the state religion of the Persian Empire, and it spread very, very far all the way from, from ancient Greece to India. Uh, it was a very large, uh, widely practiced tradition, practiced today by a fairly small community, mostly in India, though it originated in Iran. And the Zoroastrians, uh, their tradition had a major influence on all the Abrahamic religions. So these two are sort of bridge traditions, you could say, between the Abrahamic religions and the Dharma traditions. And there are other families as well. There are the East Asian traditions. If we turn to China and to Japan, there is Taoism. Uh, you'll sometimes see this spelled with the T, but uh, it's pronounced Tao. Uh, the tradition of the Tao is indigenous to China. Uh, then there is Confucianism, though the Confucians I know prefer to uh, use this term Ruism. Ru means ethics and virtue, and it's what the sage Confucius taught, also indigenous to China. And then there is Shinto, which is native to Japan. These are all three typically practiced in tandem with Buddhism. And as I mentioned previously, uh, there are parts of the world where individuals will practice more than one religion at a time, right? That their, their identity is not exclusively let's say Taoist or Confucian or Buddhist, it'll be some combination of all three. The same in Japan, people practice Shinto and Buddhism. And they, they know there are distinctions between the two traditions, but uh, they're practiced uh, by the same people. Uh, they don't really clash in terms of their teachings uh, and it's possible to practice both and many people do. 
So that's one of the things that's distinctive of, of the East Asian traditions. Now, I just mentioned Buddhism a little while ago as a tradition that comes from India, but it was one of the first traditions to also spread beyond the place of its origin. And one of the places where many people adopted Buddhism was uh, in East Asia, in China, Korea, Japan. Um, but becoming Buddhist did not preclude people from continuing to practice their older traditions. And so that has continued to the, be, be the case to the present day. Then there are what uh, scholars are sort of sometimes struggle with what to call this next family. Uh, but there are the indigenous or nature-based or cosmic religions. Uh, you hear them called by all of these names. Uh, they're usually native to a particular place and a particular people, um, but they have certain features that connect them all and, and that we, you could say, um, make them sort of cohere as a family. They're, they're indigenous or traditional Native American religions, indigenous African religions, indigenous Australian religions, indigenous religions of Oceania. Uh, and uh, in some ways, some of the traditions we've already talked about could fit into this category. Uh, Hinduism, you could argue, is the indigenous religion of India, uh, but it's given rise to other traditions, and it's really uh, kind of come to be thought of, thought of as, it, as its own kind of separate, cohesive unit. Um, Taoism, Confucianism, and Shinto are all indigenous traditions to East Asia, but they share this feature of sort of blending with Buddhism in various ways. So if we look at these other traditions, uh, we'll talk a little bit about some of the shared beliefs, but we'll see that there are sort of common traits uh, of these uh, indigenous or nature-based traditions. And a lot of scholars believe that this is the oldest form of religion, uh, the, the one represented by these religiosities. And every part of the world had its own sort of indigenous religion at one time. Uh, new and emerging religions. These are all religions that have emerged within the last two centuries, uh, which if you're a religion scholar, that's like yesterday. Uh, two centuries is not a long time <laughs> in the scale of humanity and the world religions. And so these new and emerging religions, uh, they often have historical and theological connections with pre-existing traditions. Um, so uh, a, a new religion that has emerged in, say, the Western world is likely to have a lot of connections with Christianity. Uh, for example, and might be even seen as part of Christianity uh, by its adherents uh, and even by others. Uh, some of these new and emerging religions, most of them don't have a very large following because they're fairly recent. But who knows if we were to come back, if we were to do, a, do some time travel and come back in a thousand years, some of these might be major religions someday. Uh, and every one of the major traditions that I've already talked about in terms of having large followers were new and emerging religions when they first came about, all right? Early Christianity was not the dominant religion of the world. It was a, a few people uh, living in the Roman Empire. So uh, all religions were new and emerging at one point. The, the new and emerging religions today include the Baha'i faith. It has close relations with Shia Islam in terms of the history of its emergence, but it's a distinct faith. It's a distinct tradition. Uh, the Latter-day Saints, uh, widely known as the Mormons uh, in, uh, in America, Jehovah's Witnesses, the Church of Scientology, Wicca, Neo-Paganism. These are all new and emerging traditions. Rastafarianism, they've all come about within the last century or two. So what are some of the shared beliefs and practices of these families? What makes us call them families? Some of this has to do with geography and history, right? So, the, so let's say Hinduism and Buddhism, they grew up together in the same place and in dialogue with one another. So uh, they tend to have a lot of shared terminology, a lot of shared concepts, even while having disagreements and, and differing views that differentiate them in various ways. So the Abrahamic religions emphasize belief in one supreme God, who is the creator of the universe, the establisher of moral principles, and the final judge of human life, right? Were you a good person or were you not a good person? God decides that, right? And because the Abrahamic religions have been dominant in the West, they have tended to shape the concept of religion. In fact, to such an extent that sometimes adherents of traditions from the other families, like Hindus, Buddhists, practitioners of Taoism or Shinto or indigenous religions, they'll actually say, this is not a religion. Because the concept of religion for many people, if you say, are you religious? The first thing people will often think of is God. It's like, well, if you're religious, that means you believe in God. Well, Buddhism doesn't have the concept of God, right? Buddhism is not about God. It's about other things. So is Buddhism a religion? 
if we define religion narrowly as based on the Western religious experience, it would not be. But then we wouldn't be able to talk about it in this kind of way that when, when we're trying to talk about spirituality, you could say in a, in a global sense, we'd be emitting a lot of really important things. So we have to expand the concept of religion if we're going to encompass really uh, all the traditions we've been talking about. Uh, in the Abrahamic traditions, the moral disposition of a person over the course of a lifetime determines their eternal destiny in an afterlife, right? In, in Judaism and in Islam, uh, if uh, you have obeyed God's laws, then um, certainly in Islam, the, the, the mainstream teaching is that you're received into paradise. Uh, Judaism is, in fact, quite varied in this regard. And uh, people don't often realize this because there's a tendency to sort of uh, lump Judaism in with Christianity in a way that makes people outside the Jewish tradition assume that it's it's sort of like a, almost like a variant of Christianity, but it's really not. It's really quite a, a distinct tradition. And so there's a diversity of views about uh, the afterlife uh, in Judaism. But there is the idea that it is important to live morally. That is absolutely central uh, in the Jewish tradition. In Christianity, again, the moral disposition of the person is very central, but you have the additional element of faith, faith in Christ, that that is sort of essential to uh, attaining the ultimate goal. So uh, it has to do with basically one's relationship with God, uh, being in right relation with God. In the Dharma traditions, uh, you have a very different model of reality. And so religion is playing a different role, what we call religion in the Western world. The Dharma traditions emphasize either a divine potential within each of us or a potential for total spiritual awakening that is in all living beings. So it is not so much about a relationship with a God conceived as separate and distinct from oneself, more than about, you know, it's more about finding, uh, discovering uh, that reality within oneself. So in the Hindu tradition, for example, there's a very strong emphasis of seeing God within all beings and also finding God within oneself. Um, in the Buddhist and Jain traditions, the idea of God doesn't really even enter. You're, you're looking at a, a capacity or a potential for spiritual awakening, and that's what people are trying to achieve in these traditions. We pass through many lifetimes. You have the idea of rebirth, or is sometimes called reincarnation. Uh, these lifetimes, that are, are they make up a journey to spiritual awakening or the realization of our divine potential, after which we become free from the cycle of life, death, and suffering. So what Christians call salvation, for example, eternal life with God, uh, the closest concept to that you find in the Dharma traditions is uh, this kind of liberation from the cycle of rebirth and, and a realization of our true nature uh, that is uh, issues in a state of, of eternal joy, eternal bliss. We move to the East Asian religions, so Taoism, Confucianism, Shinto. The religions of East Asia emphasize harmony among all beings and also within oneself. And the focus is much more on this lifetime. Uh, the belief in rebirth is there, but it, it's kind of been brought in through Buddhism. Uh, there's a belief in an afterlife, either as an honored ancestor. Uh, there's a very strong emphasis in the East Asian traditions on honoring and respecting and revering one's ancestors. Um, but there's also the idea of rebirth, uh, which Buddhism uh, has brought in. And so the focus in these traditions is, again, harmony, that all beings function together in a way that is beneficial to all. So this is a very strong emphasis of these traditions. Uh, the indigenous religions, uh, much like the East Asian religions, uh, uh, they emphasize the sanctity of nature itself and the maintenance of harmony among all beings in the cosmos. So the divine beings that are very uh, revered in the indigenous religions are manifestations uh, very often of natural forces. And it's very much about maintaining that balance be between nature and oneself and, of course, among human beings, among one another. This is the emphasis uh, of these traditions. And again, this is very similar to the East Asian religions, which are themselves, I would say, indigenous religions with this sort of overlay of Buddhism that has, uh, has kind of been, become infused into those traditions. Then we have the new and emerging religions. My uh, photo here is of the Baha'i Temple in uh, Wilmette, Illinois, a very striking, very beautiful site. If you're driving from Chicago towards Northwestern University, you'll go right by it. Uh, I've, I've passed it many times. I, I uh, was a student at Chicago for many years. 
Uh, the new and emerging religions are highly diverse. There's not really a single theme uniting them. So some of them came historically from Christianity or from Islam or from Hinduism or Buddhism, or really had just an entirely uh, distinct kind of modern origin. So there's no single theme uniting them as a group or family beyond what unites, we could say, all religions, which is a quest for meaning and answers to ultimate questions and a way of life that grounds our existence in the ultimate values that we discover in our quest, right? That, that our way of life, that we're not just sort of living randomly and surviving from day to day, but that our life is purposeful. And this is one thing that you could argue a, a religious identity provides to many people, right? The sense that, that I'm on a journey, that, that uh, each step I take, each day that passes, everything I do is taking me towards an ultimate destination. And this is a really a big part of how religion functions for, for many people who practice. So how should we approach religious diversity? It's an explosive topic, right? Uh, politics and religion, Roy, this, is, this scares people, right? This, this, is the, this is the stuff you're not supposed to mention at parties, right? Or, or people will edge away from you, right? People are nervous about it. And the reason people are nervous is because uh, these topics uh, aren't topics that really uh, lend themselves to easy agreement, right? Uh, uh, a contrast can be made uh, with science, uh, though if we push that too hard, uh, that might not work either. But certainly in science, you know, scientists are looking at the same set of facts. Now, th there's a lot of debate, of course, you know, you could have an adherence of different theories and they might argue with one another. But the way the process of science works is that eventually everyone looking at the same evidence is supposed to finally come to some kind of agreement, uh, you know, at least provisionally, about how things work. And, uh, you know, until some data comes along or some way of looking at the data comes along that overturns that, it's pretty consistent. And so, uh, you know, we don't talk about um, American science and Indian science and Japanese science and Brazil. Science is just science, right? But these great questions of life and death and, and meaning and purpose, a lot of the same answers have been arrived at by different traditions. Uh, one thing that you'll often hear, and it's actually true, is that some version of the golden rule is present in every major tradition. And this is true. You can find some formulation in the sacred writings of, of, of a wide range of traditions of the idea that we ought to treat others as we wish to be treated. Right? So in Christianity, of course, very famously, you know, Jesus says, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Confucius says, do not do to others what you would not want done to you. Right? So some version of this is found everywhere. But then we get into these questions, is there heaven and hell? Is there reincarnation? Is there nothing at all? What happens? How do we get to our destination? Uh, which sacred figures should we look to as authoritative when it comes to these questions? Which book should you be reading? Should you be reading a book at all? Uh, there's a lot of debate, right? That we have not come to a sort of conclusion analogous to uh, a widely held scientific theory that all religious people agree upon. Uh, and of course, not everyone's religious too. You have people whose worldview is, is uh, based on science and sort of common sense and you know, what is known in, in society. And these areas that sort of are very speculative and go beyond what we can establish through the senses, people say, oh, I just, I don't know about that. that, that would be agnosticism. Or to even go further and say, I really don't think there's anything to that, right? So, so you have atheism, agnosticism. So people not only have views about these things that differ, but for many people, the way they think is very closely tied to their identity, right? If, again, I'm thinking of Christianity. Um, it's interesting uh, in some of the, the studies I've read and some of the, some of the research I've done, and also just anecdotally, uh, the number one question that people are often asked if they leave Christianity, that is, if they decide to join another religion or if they just give up religion altogether and say, no, I'm making a break with this, I'm, I'm going to be an atheist now. The question most people are asked is not, how do you think you're going to get to heaven now? It's, are you still going to celebrate Christmas with us? Are you still coming home for Christmas? Right? It's, it's about the family. It's about identity. It's about who you are. And so people often feel that if you disagree with their religion, you're rejecting them on some profound level. So our society has tended to gravitate toward the solution of just not talking about it, right? In public places, in spaces where 
we're doing some other task, you know, like a professional space, you know, you're working in a hospital, you're working in a university, just don't talk about it. So it's become very, very private. Uh, as a result, though, uh, what has happened very often is that the conversation about religion becomes dominated by people who really don't care if they offend you or not, right? So you get a lot of these very kind of strident uh, voices dominating the conversation. And then that turns people off even more. So uh, how do we approach religious diversity? Given the vastly different religious orientations that exist, how do we create and sustain a welcoming community for all? So what I've been talking about, ignoring the issue, right? Just don't talk about it. That's an easy way out, right? Just don't talk about it. But it's often inadequate and can lead to even greater, I call it here, discomfort. I think it's actually a very profound social pressure. Uh, the, the religion scholar Mark Juergensmeyer wrote a book about religious violence uh, called Terror, uh, Terror in the Mind of God. And he makes a strong argument that the tendency of our sort of secular society to just not talk about issues of ultimate value has actually played a role in creating religious extremism and sustaining religious extremism because for people for whom religion is very important and for whom this life path and this meaning, this journey that they're on is really what life is all about, they can become increasingly alienated from the wider society if they can't even talk about what to them is very, very basic. And the, so there's this silencing and there's, there's this sort of derision also sometimes, oh, you're one of those people, oh, you know, you're sort of fanatical. And so people feel like they can't talk about it. They can't sort of be who they are in society. So what do they do? Well, most of the time people be who they are, right? With others who are like-minded. They, they gather in their community, they go to their church, their, their synagogue, their mosque, their temple, and they have bubbles and social media where they can express themselves. And, and that works for people very often. Uh, but sometimes uh, even that is not enough and uh, uh, they strike out against society, right? And so we, you know, the 21st century started with a massive act of religiously inspired terrorism, right? The events of 9-11. And uh, don't want to get too controversial, but religion was an element for certainly some of the people uh, who were storming the Capitol last week because they were talking about it. Right? They were saying you know, we're soldiers for Jesus. I mean, there were people who were interviewed who were saying these things. So just not talking about it doesn't seem to quite be working. So what do we do? What do we do? I want to argue that the best route to peaceful and happy coexistence is to, as I've said in the title of this, uh, presentation, Know Thy Neighbor. Uh, I'm, I'm playing off of, of course, the, the great commandment in Christianity to love thy neighbor. Well, if we're going to love our neighbors, uh, we need to know our neighbors. We need to know, uh, I, I want to know what is most valuable and important to the people around me. I want to know what journey they feel they're on and how that is relating to the choices they're making and the lives that they're living. And I'd like to talk about mine with them too. And I find that a far more rewarding experience. I, I feel like in some ways I'm very privileged as a religion scholar because I get to talk about this stuff all the time. But uh, suppose I was not, uh, I would probably have to be, you know, repressing all of this. Uh, now I get to talk, talk about it, you know, on Zoom. So uh, great for me, but uh, we should all be able to do this and yet not create the kind of tensions and offenses and problems that, that people uh, also worry about, right? So what should we do? We need to know our neighbors. Take time to learn about different religious beliefs and ways of life. Uh, thank you for joining this Zoom session. Right? This is one step. Uh, there are so many wonderful books about the world's religions and about different traditions. And if you're not a big reader, now we live in this wonderful era where there's multi multimedia. Uh, you can access, you know, on YouTube and, and various other places on the internet, you can find the believers and practitioners of traditions telling you, this is what we believe, this is what we're about. Uh, now, of course, we're living in an era where sometimes these things are very fraught, and there's a lot of noise out there too. But if you can tune that out and just find, you know, really good, thoughtful, serious presentations of the world's traditions, they do exist. And, and, and I'm happy to recommend some to people. And there are courses you can take, right? There, there are ways of learning about these things. Uh, but you can also just ask your neighbors, right? 
uh, in an open-minded, curious, and non-aggressive way about their religious beliefs and practices. Now, this, this takes some delicacy, right? This takes some, and I don't mean in the sense of food, right? I mean delicateness, right? That this, this requires one to be very, very careful. You have to gauge your relationship with that person. You, if you're meeting someone for the first time, you don't want to lead with, oh, what's your religious background, right? They're going to say, oh, oh what does this person want from me, right? Uh, what, what are they up to? Uh, and, and you know you scare people away. Uh, but when you have established a good relationship with someone, uh, let's say uh, I'm going to talk in a little bit about reasonable uh, sorts of uh, provisions that can be made for uh, employees and people in a workplace of, of diverse religions. Uh, let's say someone takes a day off of work to celebrate their religious holiday. That might be a good occasion to say, oh, what were you celebrating? Um, what does that commemorate? How do you celebrate it? Do you spend time with your family? Is there a special meal? What do you do? That's a very kind of friendly way of talking in a sort of non-invasive fashion, non-aggressive fashion about you know, something that someone actually really cherishes. They, they bothered to take off work for it, so it's probably important to them. And if they know you're asking for benevolent reasons, you just want to know them better, uh, they'll be very happy to talk about it typically. Uh, so, so ask. But the tone is very, very important, right? And, you know, someone might believe something that really does not fit well with your own worldview, you know? So you don't want to say something like, well, surely you don't believe that, right? Um, I was explaining a particular religious tradition uh, to my uncle many, many years ago, my late uncle. And uh, hopefully, you know, Uncle John, I'm sorry. I hope you don't mind me quoting you here. But, uh, I explained something and it stuck, struck him as strange. And he said, they don't believe that crap, do they? I mean, he just said it like that. Don't say that, right? I mean, that's, that's an example of what not to do, right? Um, I don't know if any of you have ever watched the series, The Office. Um, brilliant series. Uh, there, there's the British version, the original, which is, is really awesome. But there's also the American version with Steve Carell. And you know, there are a couple of episodes where he tries to lead some kind of sensitivity training very, very poorly, right? Uh, I, I was almost thinking of playing a clip today, but I, I decided not to. But uh, if, if you ever check out The Office, you, know, you get a, a guide to how not to talk about difference, right? Uh, don't put people on the spot. Don't uh, make people feel that they need to be defensive. But our ultimate aim, I think, should be a community where we all feel comfortable sharing who we are. And religious orientation is a big part of who we are that we are setting aside and keeping private because of very good historical and cultural and political reasons, but it's also causing us problems, I think. Don't engage in argumentation about who is right, right? See religious beliefs as something a person is sharing about themselves, not as objective truth claims, right? So they might frame them as objective truth claims. They might say, you know, this particular book is the word of God, and this is what everyone should believe. Remember, you know, even if they're not saying it that way, in your mind, think of it as what we call an I statement. They're telling you what they think. And that's a fact about them, just like where they were born and how many brothers and sisters they have and, uh, you know, how many languages they know, uh, whatever that might be. Uh, what they believe is something about them. Now, I'm a philosopher. I, I love arguing. Right? I, I love engaging in the, these questions because I'm very curious myself about what is true. And if you're you know, really good friends with someone, you might be able to, as they say, go there right? and say, well, why do you think that? Well, what's the evidence for that? Well, what do you think about this other way of thinking? But certainly if it's a, a situation where you don't know the person well, I really strongly recommend looking at people's beliefs as facts about them. You're wanting to know them. You're wanting to coexist with them. Arguing about the universe can happen at some other time or place, right? Only when you have a close and mutually respectful uh, relationship would you want to engage in any kind of theological or philosophical debate. I think this is very, very important. Um, take advantage of invitations to observe or participate in religious events, festivals, and so on. If you're curious about another tradition, another community, Let's say you have a Hindu neighbor and she says, oh, I'm going to the temple to celebrate Diwali. Uh, say, can I come along? Would that be okay? Would that be all right? Um, you know, and come see and, and you'll have a great experience and, and you'll, you'll get a, uh, the lived sense of the community. And 
even if you don't learn very much at all about beliefs in that, you'll just see how people exist together and you know, what fun they have and you know, what kinds of colorful and interesting things people do. And uh, it'll, it's, it'll just be a great way to, to know your neighbor uh, on a much more in-depth level. Remember again that a person is not their religion. Religious communities are often highly diverse and each person's interpretation and level of engagement is different. Uh, so um, it's very well known, for example, that the cow is seen as a sacred symbol in the Hindu tradition. And cows in, in, uh, among Hindus traditionally are, are not eaten and it's not uh, you know, part of the Hindu diet to eat what we call beef in America, right? Uh, if you have a Hindu coworker who sits down and has a Big Mac at lunchtime, don't say, you're a Hindu, you're not supposed to be eating that, right? He knows what he's doing, and right? he has his understanding of his life and what he's doing. And uh, if you know the person well, you could have a conversation about it. But uh, don't be shocked when people don't live like living, breathing stereotypes of their religious identity, because we're all complex, and we all have different interpretations. And that person I just described might be a very serious Hindu, but his understanding of what Hinduism is may be very different from that of other people. And this isn't just a wild imaginary uh, example. I, I've, I've seen this, I've had this experience. So um, this is something uh, also very important to bear in mind. We're all complex. Each person in a sense really has their own religion because they have their own worldview and their own way of understanding uh, whatever tradition, if any, that they're, they're, they're connected with. We all have our own religious orientation. Um, reasonable accommodations uh, for religious diversity. Uh, this is an important topic, especially in the workplace. What are some things, if any of you are supervisors or employers, uh, that you might be asked uh, or expected to uh, accommodate? Um, a big one is time off for religious observances. So, you know, the, the Western calendar is very much centered around Christianity. You know, like Christmas, that's a big holiday and so on. So uh, many of the other traditions uh, have different holidays, uh, I mean, they all do, uh, that are not going to necessarily fall somewhere conveniently uh, on the Christian calendar or during a weekend. Uh, Judaism has a lunar calendar. Hinduism has a lunar calendar. So Diwali or Rosh Hashanah, they're going to be around the same time every year, but not exactly the same time. And it might be during the week and it might be on a work day, but if someone is very observant, they they probably will want to take off that time and be with their family, be with their community and participate in that. So that is a reasonable accommodation and it can be uh, planned in advance, right? Things like work schedules, some, you know, trading a shift with somebody, this can all be uh, arranged so that it doesn't create any problems uh, in the workplace. A time or place for prayer or other observance. Many hospitals I know have chapels. Um, there are traditions like Islam where many practitioners will pray several times throughout the day. And traditionally in Islam, it's five times a day. Now, different Muslims have different practices, so there are different degrees of flexibility in terms of when you do that. For some people, it's very important to do it at this particular time. So to make it possible for someone, say, on their break, to have a quiet space to go and do that, right? You might not want to do your prayers in the big break room where people are, you know, having sandwiches and chatting, right? You, you might want a quiet space for that. So to ensure that that is available. The ability to wear religious garb that does not interfere with work duties. Religious garb ranges from, you know, someone might be wearing a little tiny cross that you don't even notice uh, or Star of David, but uh, there are also various kinds of head, head uh, coverings that people wear. Uh, of course, uh, Islam is sort of famous for this, but in the Sikh tradition, men very often will wear a turban. Some women do too. Um, and uh, it seems that if, if it does not create a safety issue, uh, that uh, some kinds of religious attire uh, should, be, uh, should be allowed for. Uh, there are traditions in which it's considered mandatory to wear that attire. So it's, it's important to accommodate that as much as possible. Uh, similarly with hairstyles, other sort of personal attributes connected with religious affiliation, tattoos in some cases, uh, honoring dietary requirements. Uh, this is especially the case if you're having meetings or training sessions and serving a meal. Uh, make sure that there's something that everyone can eat, right? Make sure there's something that uh, there are people uh, like in the Jewish tradition observing kosher uh, 
restrictions or in Islam, halal. Halal and kosher, by the way, are pretty much identical. So if, if you have a kosher meal, that would also uh, work also in the case of someone who's Muslim. Uh, in many of the Dharma traditions, many Hindus, not all, but many are vegetarian. Uh, Jains are typically not only vegetarian, but vegetarians of a very strict variety. There are even some vegetables that, that Jains don't eat uh, if they're observant. So to ensure that everyone can eat, right? And uh, this is, again, if, if it's planned beforehand, it could be done fairly easily. Uh, so the principle underlying all of this is really sensitivity, accommodation, and you could say the golden rule, right? Uh, how would, you know, you also would want to be accommodated. Uh, a very important one, I think this might be even the most important one, is time off during a mourning period for a deceased relative. Right? And different traditions do different things at the time that someone passes away. And uh, someone might need to just take off a day to go to a funeral. Someone might need to take off for a week and use their vacation time to do uh, a proper mourning period according to the strictures of their tradition. So again, this kind of compassionate accommodation is very, very important. So that is the end of my formal presentation. Um, let's see, I'm, I'm looking to where I can stop sharing my screen because uh, there we are. And uh, you can see me again. Uh, so uh, yes, I've spoken for, uh, we, we had talked previously about my talking between 45 minutes and an hour and it looks like it's been about 55 minutes. So we're okay. <laughs> uh, I wanna thank everyone for listening and I'm open for questions. I'm here to take any questions people have. Uh, to the best of my ability. If I don't know the answer, I'll try to refer you to uh, some place or book or, or person who, who can. Thank you very much, Dr. Long. This was so interesting. And I, I think one of the takeaways is just to be comfortable asking, you know, asking your friends and your neighbors to explain a little bit more about what they believe, when it's appropriate to do so, and, and not assuming, you know, not assuming that because you think somebody is a certain religion that they subscribe to what you may assume are parts of those religions. And so I, I, I think that's really interesting. I don't know that I thought about it that way before, but uh, we are all individuals and there are lots of interpretations and, and different flavors of all these religions, as you mentioned. That's right. Thank you. We, uh, we do have a comment from uh, somebody on uh, YouTube uh, who says he will um, share a presentation or a link uh, it's from a, a gentleman named Tom, uh, a group called Raft Ups, in which we contemplate our beliefs or non-beliefs in a non-threatening, non-judgmental, uh, non-proselytizing way. And he's going to share uh, the presentation, I suppose, with other people uh, who've been watching this. So um, we, uh, we thank him for paying attention and for offering some additional insights we might be able to consume as well. Wonderful. That, that sounds, I'm not familiar with that organization, but it sounds like exactly the kind of thing that we need more of really, frankly, in this world. And uh, just a thanks from someone else. That's a great presentation. You'd share, shared some great points about sensitivity. So thank you. Any um, sort of takeaways that you'd like us to remember? There was so much information. I mean, what would you say were sort of the, the key takeaways that you would like people to remember so that we can learn to better understand each other and, and build uh, you know, more welcoming, affirming communities? Yes, absolutely. Thank you. No, I, I, a word I think I did not use, but it's really sort of implied everywhere, but now this is a chance for me to use it. Uh, empathy really is the key to all of this. I think if we cultivate empathy, if we really think about, again, in sort of golden rule terms, how would we want to be treated uh, when it comes to our beliefs and practices? Right? Uh, if what we want is that everyone will agree with us, well, that's not realistic, right? Uh, uh, a great figure from, uh, from my own tradition, Swami Vivekananda, a great, great Hindu uh, sage uh, of the 19th century, uh, said, if you think everyone is going to agree with you, he says, brother, yours is a false hope, right? So we can't expect everyone to agree with us. In fact, we can almost expect the opposite, right? People are not going to agree on everything, even if you agree on a lot, there's something you're going to disagree about. So empathy, how would you want, how do you want the other person to respond to your beliefs, the fact that you think a certain way, and then to extend that same uh, treatment to them, right? That if you uh, would like 
to be respected and not thought less of because you have certain views, then you need to extend that same courtesy to everyone else. And uh, another thing I guess I would like to mention since we have some time is uh, a question that often comes up in this context is that if we're really honest and we look at not just the major traditions, but sort of like religiosity as a whole around the world, there are beliefs that are frankly scary and dangerous, right? There, there are, uh, there are, you know, there are death cults, right? I mean, uh, I'm sure people are familiar with the Jonestown, uh, the mass suicide. This is where the phrase, you know, drank the Kool-Aid comes from, uh, where so many people uh, died. Um, I remember in the late 90s, there was a group called Heaven's Gate who you know, took their own lives uh, thinking they were going to be sort of uh, resurrected uh, on a spacecraft. Um, we know about, you know, uh, ISIS, for example, uh, not the ancient Egyptian goddess, but, you know, the, the, the organization that claims to operate in the name of Islam, but its interpretation of Islam is very, very far from the mainstream of that tradition. And uh, we're not likely to encounter anything like that in our work lives because uh, the people who, who adhere to those kinds of beliefs tend to gather together with their own group and live secluded from society. And so we should really be, I think, uh, minimally at least tolerant, but ideally empathetic and accepting when we hear our coworkers, our family members, uh, our neighbors express beliefs that you know just maybe don't make sense to us, but understand that that's just a different way of looking at the world. And uh, maybe right, maybe wrong, but you know, we have to decide that for ourselves, but to just treat that as, as part of who they are. I would say uh, people often ask me, so you grew up Catholic, now you practice Hinduism. How did your family react to you? I would put my family up as almost a model in some ways of, of, of how I would like to see people get along because I know my family members don't share all my beliefs or agree with everything that I think, but they sort of treat it as part of my lovable eccentricity, I guess you could say. And so, you know, if we could be like that with one another, not condescending, but just saying, okay, well, that's, that's part of who you are. So I, I think that's the thing that I would also, as a takeaway, want to really reaffirm. Uh, not so much that we engage in debate with people about what's right and what's wrong. There is a place for that. Like, I love that. I, I enjoy that kind of, of, of give and take. But in most of our social relations, we need to treat people's worldviews with respect, which means seeing it as an element of that person. And if you like that person, you, you enjoy the company that person well that is part of who that person is right sometimes you hear this expression hate the sin love the sinner now there's a context where i think that's really true right there are people who make mistakes in life but we don't want to you know completely dismiss them because of that but if we see someone else's worldview or way of thinking as well i really don't like that but i like the person and we try to sort of compartmentalize that's actually doing violence in a way to to the person right part of what makes them who they are is that whole belief system that they participate in so i think this sort of seeing the way other people live and and practice and believe as just part of who they are uh is really a a, a big step and again you know once you're sort of like really comfortable with someone, you know, then you can say, well, now what about this? You know, then you can kind of, kind of engage in that more, you know, kind of uh, cognitive side of it. Uh, so often people just jump straight to that. And that's often what spoils human relations. Also, because not everyone in a religious tradition is a theologian, right? If you push a lot of people, I would say in just about every tradition, if you push them really hard about what they believe, they'll come to a point and say, well, I don't know. I just think that, right? This is what I grew up with. And that's really not fair to kind of push someone to that point. It's, it's important to uh, just let them be who they are and understand, right? We want to know our neighbor, right? Know thy neighbor. So that means understanding each other. Uh, you know, let the kind of, you know, critical part come at a later point when good human relations have been established and, and won't be spoiled by it. We have a question from YouTube. Um, they're curious, what are your thoughts about teaching religion in public schools? Oh, that's a wonderful question. That's a wonderful, I think it should be mandatory in public schools. Uh, uh, the separation of church and state requires that schools, now I'm talking about, yeah, public, yeah, the question was about public schools. Mm -hmm. It requires that no religion be promoted 
by a public institution. And I'm fully in agreement with that, right? We're all paying the taxes regardless of our belief system. So we're not paying for some other belief system be, to be promoted there, right? There are private schools for that, right? If you want to, you know, I've, I went to Catholic school in first and second grade and then in college, that was their prerogative, right? It was a private institution. You didn't have to go there. And that, that's what, you know, they were about. But in the public schools, it should never be promoted, but it's such a vital part of human history, human existence, everything from art to literature to why some of the great figures of history made the decisions that they did. It's incomprehensible if we don't understand religion. And I think religion really does need to be taught. And if you're cynical, you could say, well, you're a religion professor. You have a, a professional self-interest in this, right? You, you want to you wanna have a lot of students that you're training to go and, and, and be religion teachers. Well, that, that might be part of it, but uh, I, I think it is as important as STEM education, right? That because there's so much religious misunderstanding in the world and so much miscommunication and as a result, so much violence, uh, it's really vital to human survival that we understand each other, and it's vital to understanding one another that we understand the religions. I, I think every graduate of a public school in America should be able to give something like the basic rundown I gave of the world religions, right? So some just at least some, some basic teachings, a little bit of history, and ideally even more than that, right? Some in-depth engagement with the text. Um, there was a controversial uh, move made, and I don't remember all the facts, but I think that a number of years ago, there was a move made to teach the Bible in schools in Pennsylvania. And I think it was advocated by many religious organizations, and I think that that was part of the reason there was a lot of opposition to it. But a lot of people said, oh, no, separation of church and state. But my recollection is that the intent behind it was not to teach the Bible as scripture, but just to, to teach about the Bible, right? So the people would know the stories, would know uh, the basic morals and ideals taught because they've shaped not just Western, but now global civilization. So it's important to know about it. So I'm, I'm a big advocate of uh, the study of world religions in the public school. I, in fact, I'd like to see a little bit of it at every stage, going from elementary all the way up to, to um, graduation from high school. Because I, I, think, I think we'd be much more informed then about everything. As you said, it has been sort of taboo with that separation of, of, uh, of church and the schools. But I wonder, with schools taking more of a... Um, a step toward diversity, equity, and inclusion education, if this could be become a part of it, you know, instead of it being a separate piece, because it is all about building that better understanding. Absolutely. I, I strongly agree with you. And I think that is maybe how the opening is going to happen so that people can also learn about religion. Because we, we've discovered that if we ignore difference, if we try to be, for example, colorblind, that doesn't really work, right? Uh, people have all kinds of differences that they're proud of and that, that it's part of who they are. And religion is an integral element of, of all of that. But we set that aside. Interestingly, um, it is legal. Uh, it is permissible for schools to teach world religions. And there are schools, public schools, that have really good world religion curricula because the teachers have, have an interest in it and they have a sufficient background to do it. But what I'm told, at least, is that even though it's permissible, many schools just don't do it because they're afraid of you know, lawsuits and objections. Uh, and again, that there has to be great care taken to say that there's a difference between teaching a religion and teaching about a religion. Right? So that you're not giving religious instruction on the assumption that the, that the, the children or the, the, the teenagers, whoever you're teaching, are members of that religion and they need to learn how to practice it correctly. As a, that can happen in a Sunday school, that can happen in a temple, in a mosque, in a synagogue, uh, at home. Uh, but learning about the religions, in fact, I think it's also important that everyone get the same information base about the world's religions. Because another thing that happens, if we surrender teaching about religion completely to religious communities, Often, unfortunately, they teach very negative and stereotyped things about one another. So you'll learn really bad things about another religion if you just are getting a religious education. Whereas if you're really getting this kind of, we're going to learn about religion, we're going to read, you know, we're going to read texts, we're going to study history, we're going to look at the facts. Um, when you have that knowledge base, it's much harder to 
push negative stereotypes because people will know, well, that's not really correct. You know, what you're saying about that religion, well, that, that isn't really quite how it works because they'll have, they'll be armed with that information. I was struck the last time you spoke about the story, you told how there was a Christmas tree, I believe, at Elizabethtown College and someone yes. wanted to call it a holiday tree. Can you talk about that a little bit and why that isn't maybe a good idea? <laughs> That's right. Oh, yes. The holiday tree. Oh, yeah. That, that, that's, that, thank you for remembering that. So a number of years ago, we have a beautiful evergreen tree in front of our library here on our campus. And it's been decorated with lights. And every year as it gets close to Christmas, they turn the lights on. And it's become a tradition for at a certain point to, to have some kind of gathering, you know, there's some fair and Christmas carols and that sort of thing. And someone uh, decided that in the name of inclusion, in the, in the name of empathy and, and acceptance, that it be renamed the Holiday Tree. And I wrote a letter to the editor of our, our student paper uh, saying why this was, in fact, a very bad idea, uh, even though the intention was good, right? The intention is, oh, we don't want to impose Christmas on everyone, not everyone's Christian, and so on. However, when you call it the holiday tree, as if it's a religiously neutral symbol, it actually does something, I don't want to say sinister, but uh, really the opposite of what is intended. The implication is this tree is now everybody's symbol. You know, let us all now gather under the holiday tree. Well, you know, there's no Diwali tree in Hinduism, right? There, there, there's, no, uh, there's no Ramadan tree in Islam, right? There, there, the, you know, uh, and Hanukkah in Judaism, there's a menorah, which has it's a candle with branches, but it's not a tree, right? So a, a Christmas tree is recognizably a Christmas tree. It's a Christian symbol. In fact, it used to be a pagan symbol. It's a symbol taken from the indigenous religions of Europe and given a Christian meaning. Uh, but it's, it's a Christmas tree. So uh, what I said in my letter was, let the Christmas tree be a Christmas tree. Let anyone who wants to, let Christians and anyone who wants to sing Christmas carols and, and say prayers and, and read from the gospel, as long as all the rest of us can also celebrate our holidays, right? As long as there's also a space for, you know, Holi, Diwali, uh, Ramadan, um, uh, Hanukkah, Rosh Hashanah, uh, let their, you know, let everyone have their, have their holiday. But if we try to put everyone under the same tree, uh, it's really actually imposing one cultural tradition on everyone. And, and they, they heard me because they, they now call it the Christmas tree. They, they withdrew that. And, and they meant well. I understand what they were trying to do. But the idea is not to create some kind of watered down tradition that everyone can be part of, but that is really just a thinly veiled version of, of the dominant tradition. But just let everybody be what they are. Just maximum diversity. Um, in fact, now, some people might think this sounds extreme, but India manages to do it with a much larger population than the United States has. India actually gives everyone the day off for every major holiday of every world religion. And hardly a week goes by that there isn't, you know, a day off somewhere because it's, it's a Sikh holiday or a Hindu holiday or a Christian holiday or a Buddhist holiday or a Zoroastrian holiday. And that's wonderful, right? Everyone gets the day off. Everyone has a good time. And uh, it, it's uh, a way of honoring everybody. And uh, I personally like that approach, uh, that kind of, uh, you know, letting everybody do their thing. Um, but because a sort of a, of a false unity it was really very thin. And of course, more conservative people in a religious tradition are going to be offended by it. You know, there will, people, there will be people in some traditions who would see a Christmas tree you know, or any kind of tree. They would see it as an idol. I'm not going to go there, you know. So being welcoming really means letting everyone be who they are. And another piece of it as well is that, uh, you know, the, the people who decided it would be a good idea to call it the holiday tree were probably thinking, oh, we have people who are religious minorities and we don't want to sort of push Christmas on them. But what happens is that uh, very often you'll have people in the majority tradition, which in America is Christianity, in India it's Hinduism, but you see similar issues play out in both countries. The majority tradition feels, ah, everyone has religious freedom except me, right? Uh, we're persecuted because we can't say Merry Christmas, right? And people actually claim this. People have made a career out of claiming this. Um, it, it may or may not be true, but uh, in fact, I think it's not true. 
but that feeling does get created if there's this sense of, oh, you have to not really be who you are in order to allow everyone else to be who they are. No, we should all be uh, allowed to be who we are uh, as people with a religious orientation, including people with uh, a religious orientation of not being religious. Uh, I don't know how many Seinfeld fans there are now, but I remember the, the idea of Festivus. Uh, th th that's great, right? I mean, th that's, uh, uh, that should be there too. We, uh, I did want to share uh, one of our viewers did mention that uh, religion apparently is taught in the Dairy Township schools in a uh, world history class. So um, some students are getting it at some point if they, at least if they teach that class. So that's good. That's wonderful. You know, yeah, and a lot of schools do offer it. And uh, usually on the first day of class of my, uh, of, of a lot of the courses I teach at Elizabethtown College, I will ask students, uh, you know, to introduce themselves. And one of the things I ask them is, do you have any background in this material already? Have, what have you already learned? And quite a few took uh, a world religions class at some point in, in high school, history or social studies. And that's good. It's, it's not totally absent. I wish it were even more pervasive and thorough than, than it already is. But I'm, I'm really glad to hear that, that it's there in, in Derry Township. That's good. This is probably a, a question that requires about three hours to answer, but you did touch a little bit on the connection between religion and politics. And yes. how can we as community members um, avoid assuming that someone's religion dictates their politics or vice versa? Because as you mentioned, there are many different interpretations of, of different religions. So, so how can we avoid from, from just making those assumptions? Well, that's, that's a really good point. And in fact, I mean, in one sense, the answer is very simple. And then in another, like you said, it could take three hours to unpack. Um, the, the simple part is just don't do it, right? Uh, not to make those assumptions. So for example, um, there are a lot of people who support uh, the Republican Party. For example, I'll just say, you know, a lot of people support the Republican Party who see that as almost a requirement of their Christian beliefs. There are other Christians who do exactly the opposite for the same reason, right? So people are reading the same gospels, but they're reading it a little differently. And so one group of people will interpret it as, you know, we need a sort of a very conservative interpretation of the constitution and the laws and, and so on. And then other people say, oh, this is a, the gospel is a charter to work for social justice and bring about the kingdom of heaven where everyone is, you know, where, where the poor, where, where the least, where those who've been trodden upon are, are uplifted. And, and so those two groups will then clash politically, but they're reading the same Bible. Right. And, uh, you know, so, um, what I think would be this doesn't this isn't quite an answer to your question, but it's kind of I'm just extending this this thought a little bit. I would like to see more. You know, we need interreligious dialogue, but we also need intra-religious dialogue. It would be great to see people who read the same Bible and take it in opposite political directions get together and talk about their interpretation and have some of that real kind of give and take. Like you know, well, we think that when Jesus said this, this is what he meant, and Someone else said, well, when, we, when Jesus said this, this is what we think. Uh, something else also I think to recognize is that even though our discourse is very polarized into the two political parties, if you talk to individuals, you'll actually find that just like people aren't sort of cookie cutter, you know, cutouts or stereotypes of their religion, it's also true of their politics. Uh, I came of age, like I said, in the Catholic tradition, and I personally experienced this, and I had very good friends. I went to University of Notre Dame for college, very Catholic university. We had a, my friends and I had a lot of conversations about this. The fact that the policies of the two parties, neither of them corresponded quite with Catholic social teaching, because the Democratic Party was very much in alignment with the church on all kinds of social justice issues, war and peace issues, and so on. But the abortion issue is also a big one for the Catholic faith. And that was the one taken up by the other party. So people were very, you know, uh, sort of distraught about, you know, I don't really like either of these parties. I like this bit of this one and this bit of that one. And I think that's, I, I hope I'm not going out on too much of a limb here, but I feel like that's actually where a lot of Americans are. Uh, if we set aside all the rhetoric and all the sort of very fierce kind of tribalism that has entered the discourse, there's some things that people agree with in one side and some they agree with in the other. In fact, I have a colleague at Elizabethtown College who studies 
uh, political psychology, uh, April Kelly Westner, and uh, she told me something very interesting about this. And we talk a lot because politics and religion in some ways are very similar fields. She did an experiment where she would put up a policy on the board and ask students, do you agree with this policy? Why or why not? You know, how many people agree with it? Someone raised their hands. How many would disagree with it? Others would raise their hands. And, you know, they would go through several policies. And then she revealed which party supported which policies. And a bunch of them suddenly had to change their view because, oh, I gave the wrong answer, right? Oh, oh, I'm a Republican. I'm not supposed to like that. Or, oh, I'm a Democrat. I'm not supposed to like that. So it's interesting. I mean, I, I think we're actually, if we look at our views on individual issues, I think we as Americans are actually all over the map politically, but we've become polarized into these two groups. And so that's going to require a lot of dialogue uh, across this divide for people to find what they really have in common with each other. And, you know, it's interesting. It even seeps into the wider culture, right? It's almost like, you know, if you like country music, you have to like one particular party. Well, maybe you don't. Maybe you like country music and you like the other party, right? So um, the fact that people are complex, that, that we have so many individual uh, commitments and views and preferences and orientations that make us up, uh, that gets flattened out when we engage in tribalism. So I would say, I, I guess, uh, to get to kind of circle back to your question, to, to th this practice of empathy and just really getting to know each person as they are and not as a token or representative, either of a religion or of a political party, but just as who they are, uh, would really go a long way toward, I think, healing our, our relations with one another. Well, we're getting close to needing to wrap up, but we did have one viewer ask if there are any books or podcasts that you would recommend that could help broaden our understanding of diverse um, and different religions. Uh, yes, in terms of books, um, I strongly recommend, there. there is an excellent book about the world's religions. Uh, and uh, it's by Houston Smith, who passed away just recently. And he changed the title of the book. It used to be called The Religions of Man. And then he realized that that sounded very sexist because, in fact, more women tend to be religious than men. Uh, I believe it's now called The Religions of Humanity. And that is a wonderful book for just kind of getting introduced to the basics of the traditions. I would also recommend a book by Ibu Patel uh, called Acts of Faith. He is the founder of the Interfaith Youth Corps. And that is an organization dedicated to greater interreligious understanding, understanding across different religious orientations. And uh, um, it, it tells about his personal journey. And, you know, he went from being, uh, he grew up Muslim, but he went from being a, you know, sort of a nominal Muslim to uh, actually kind of suddenly realizing, kind of being thrust into his identity after 9-11, because he realized, okay, that suddenly marked him in a way that it hadn't before. And uh, that led him to, uh, to developing the Interfaith Youth Corps. And, and he has a background in sociology and he has a lot to say about how we can develop a civil society uh, that is more attentive to all of our various differences. So Acts of Faith is a book that I would also uh, strongly recommend um, in addition to Houston Smith. And then um, oh, there, this is getting a little more uh, sort of academic Academic, but uh, I was just writing a paper about this particular scholar today who inspired me a lot. There, there's a philosopher of religion named John Hick. Uh, he also passed away just a few years ago, but he developed a really very interesting, he called it the pluralistic hypothesis, a way of talking and thinking about religious diversity, uh, seeing diverse traditions as all responses to a transcendent reality. And what people believe about that reality, whether they see it as God or as something totally impersonal or even as just nature itself, uh, we're all orienting toward that in our various ways. And uh, say so he has a really good book on this called uh, An Interpretation of Religion. Now, th this is, it's a scholarly book, but if you're really very, very interested in this, I think John Hick is a good good person to, to pursue. Uh, in terms of podcasts, I'm blanking right now, but I know they exist. Uh, I know they're good po podcasts on specific traditions. Uh, if uh, you want to know more, more about Hindu philosophy, there's a really good one called Vedanta and Yoga. Vedanta is Hindu philosophy. And uh, the, uh, the monk who, who teaches it is, is very... Uh, very profound, and, and he gives a lot of, and, and Vedanta, it, it comes from Hinduism, but 
uh, it's, it's sort of a universal philosophy and uh, it draws a lot from different traditions. And so you'll hear a lot of the speakers will talk, they'll talk about Christianity, they'll talk about Islam, they'll talk about ancient Greek philosophy and sort of bring all of these things together into a conversation. So uh, I think those are all good starting places, uh, definitely. I, I think we got those written down properly, but we'll check with you tomorrow and make sure we have them right. And then we can add them to the recording so that people can reference them and, and link out to them. So thank you very, very much, Dr. Long. Again, we enjoyed the conversation. We hope that uh, you also enjoy the gift basket that is coming to you from the first yeah. time. <laughs> so thank you. We treats coming your way. Uh, and, and Amy's going to tell us a little bit more about uh, what's to come and also uh, a thank you for our listeners tonight and, and information on our survey as well. Yes. Uh, thank you, Dr. Long. Uh, I just wanted to thank everyone who joined us today. Uh, you should have by now in your inbox another follow-up survey. We really want to you know, make sure that we're providing content that you find helpful and useful. And so we want to ask you a very few anonymous questions about what you learned this evening and how you can use it moving forward. So if you could just take two moments to click on that and fill it out, we would be eternally grateful. Um, and I do want to plug our next event, which is scheduled for March 24th. The topic is supporting transgender and diverse gender youth. Our speaker is Amy Keesling. She is a licensed clinical social worker with over 30 years of experience, and she recently um, took on the position as coordinator of the new pediatric and adolescent gender health clinic at Penn State Health, serving the needs of transgender and gender diverse children, adolescents, young adults, and their families. Uh, we're very excited to have her with us in March. So. Uh, stop on by Eventbrite to register. That's the best way for you to keep getting communications about upcoming um, diversity events. So thank you everyone, Susan, Dr. Long, Brian behind the curtain who always helps us technically. <laughs> yes, big thanks to Brian Blausch from Dairy Township for making this all possible tonight. And, and as Amy said, many thanks to Dr. Long and everybody who joined us to watch. Uh, it's only together that we can learn how to make our community more affirming and welcoming. And, and this was another great session. Dr. Long, please come back and see us again. Thank you so much. Thank you for uh, including me in this. And I, I really appreciate it. Thanks. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night.